All right, welcome everybody. This is uh, Where Do I Start? The first 365 days of building a security program with uh, Hudson Bush. Hudson is a senior information security architect at K2 Solutions, Inc. in Southern California. When not home brewing, Hudson spends his time assisting small and medium businesses with securing their networks. Please welcome Hudson to StrelCon 2018. Thank you. I haven't, one second, slight technical difficulty. That's better. Okay, so um, before the talk, I was I was asked how deep do I plan on going. This talk is a mile wide and a few inches deep. There is there are a few points where I really dive deep, but the idea here is that there are a lot of talks that I feel like are either beginner or advanced. There's not a lot of the middle. There's not a lot of uh... <laughs> okay. So now I've actually started. Well, what do I do in the meantime before I become an expert who can actually give my own talk? And this is, this comes out of, obviously this is what I do. I work with a, I work with mainly small businesses, but companies up to honestly about six, 7,000 seats, but mostly with no security posturing. So, um, an anti-disclaimer, this talk does represent the views of my employer. <laughs> Everything that I say, um, I, I more or less run the cybersecurity division at my employer. So everything that I say, you can quote me on. <laughs> um, and a big focus of this is how to prioritize. I've seen too many people who, when they start this, they, they have their priorities. Oh, well, I heard someone say that the most important thing is multi-factor authentication. So that's the very first thing I'm going to do. That may be. It also may not be. So this is helping choose your intel sources, figuring out who, is a, who are the good resources, what things to ultimately Google, because you, in 365 days in the first part, there's going to be a lot of research. And it's, it's how to prioritize. So I covered a little bit of this. This is scenario, but it also could read um, my biases or my background. I, I mainly work with small and medium businesses that are privately owned. I think that's important to say privately owned because I think there is a special focus um, from APTs and corporate espionage on public companies. That's not to say that private companies are not targeted. They're just targeted in different ways. Um, I work at an architect and manager level, but because I work with a smaller team, I do a lot of engineer responsibilities. So this has a good mix between actually doing things and documenting and planning those things. And then I have a strong preference for open source, but anything in here can scale out of open source. Um, but the technologies I'm going to talk about are mostly open source. Same with the small to medium business um, point. Anything here can scale to a large enterprise. Um, uh, the companies I work with are mainly in the military manufacturing realm, which means that uh, the compliance regulations that are on them, NIST 800-171, are mostly a joke. <laughs> Anyone who's worked with that uh, re realizes that it's, it's uh, for example, when it talks about policy, password policy, it says implement a password policy. And you could literally say, my password policy is to have users change their password every 300, you know, 300 years and one character. That's a password policy. So there's a lot of room to play around. So while I will talk about compliance, there's also, I'm going to talk about choosing your own path. Because if you're having to do PCI or NIST 853, there's obviously, you have to follow this because otherwise you might lose your business. Um, as always, um, management does expect some sort of results in a year. So that's why the 365 days. And then with few exceptions, mo the companies I work with are all Windows endpoints and servers. So there's going to be obviously a huge focus on Windows. Again, certain things will scale, certain things won't. Um, and, and kind of the scenarios that I envision here are maybe you're in IT and suddenly management for whatever reason because they heard about the target breach or Equifax or something, they suddenly care about security. <laughs> so, hey, you're the only sysadmin, you're responsible for 300 users, you're also help desk, you, uh, <laughs> you, you manage everything, but now you have to get us secure enough to not be breached. We want you to tell us how you're going to do it in a year. Um, or maybe you've previously worked at a level one SOC analyst, you got brought into a company that bait and switches you and finally says, oh, by the way, you're not working in a SOC, you're, only, you're the only guy in InfoSec, so you're also the manager, you have to run all this. So then you ask yourself, oh shit, I have to do what? So, um, 
I've broken this up into four phases. Um, the, the boring stuff, uh, if you want to sleep, now is a good time. Uh, planning and discovery, it is also the single most important part. Um, and a little disclaimer in this part, I'm not, I know that this is typically in the manager level, the people who do the planning and the discovery. A lot of times, you know, engineers, if that's where you find yourself, you're a level one security engineer, you're an analyst. You might think, oh, this is management. And I'm not gatekeeping and saying that the only people who can do this type of work are managers. But I am saying that everyone who does high level security work needs to understand what and why they're security. Um, and I feel like that's a gap too often. Um, while there may be a few slides in this, that does not mean that every slide needs to take three weeks. Some of these slides could take a day. You may just talk to IT, get your answers, move on. Um, so where I would start is pick a framework. You need to understand how you're securing. You need to understand, you don't want to just reinvent the wheel and think, I think this is important, I'm going to do this. Um, I, ISO is, is great for certain things. Um, I work with a lot of companies that use ISO for, for QA, so they're already familiar with it. It's almost the uh, nobody gets fired for buying Cisco. If you propose ISO, management's going to like it, but it does cost to get certified. It costs it to use. So for a small org, maybe that's not where you start. One benefit that I have been pitching to companies, and we're working with an app, a small app developer on this, is using cybersecurity infosec as a sales point. Put the we are ISO 27,000 certified on your website. Don't just retroactively say, oh yeah, we did care about your security, but we got breached. You know, we care now. At the beginning, when you're getting customers, train your salespeople to say, we, this is how we protect your data. Do this from the very beginning. And I think that getting a certification as a company is a great, a great way to prove that. Instead of just empty words, we're unhackable. Um, this is the closest you can really get to proving it in an easy way um, without fluff words. There's NIST CSF. It's a lot stricter than the CIS controls. But what I would recommend for most companies, if you don't have some sort of compliance need, start with your CIS controls. There's a lot more flexibility. There's a lot, there's a lot more you can do in there. And since there's mappings from the CIS controls to pretty much every other framework, it's an easy place to start. Um, like I just said, if you do need compliance for you know, regulatory compliance, that'll substitute for a framework because your path has been chosen for you. You can still pick what you prioritize, what you do first, because obviously you're not going to check every box in a year. If you do, then you have a bigger team than I generally work with. Um, and then use this as the basis for the system security plan. Essentially, find your framework, find your compliance needs and translate it into a way where for every control you can mark what you're doing about it, what your plan is. Um, and I'm gonna talk gap analysis a little later. I know that a huge part of your framework in SSP are, um, is the gap analysis. Uh, and while, while I'm not necessarily just a CIS fanboy, this talk does ultimately go through, um, through eight of the CIS controls. It goes through one through six and then 17 through 19. Um, oh, and I want to pause for a second. All of my, uh, my notes and my slides will be online. I'll have a link to that at the end. So if that helps you taking your notes, good. And I, backing up for one second, if you do have questions at any point, you can tweet me or tweet to the hashtag. I will be monitoring that. So easy way to ask questions so you don't forget them at the end. Resource assessment. Um, I, put, I put this here, do I start buying things now? I'm, I, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, um, but I'm gonna say it anyways. I, I have seen environments where let's buy everything. Let's buy a SIM, let's buy a new next-gen antivirus, let's buy DLP, let's buy a FIM, let's buy everything at the same time. But we have no resources and no plan to implement them. And then suddenly, three years later, you've been paying the licenses and none of these tools do anything. Um, so, spoiler alert, you do not start buying things now. It's going to be much later. There's a lot you can do with the tools you already have. But the, the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, I heard that Splunk is awesome. I'm going to buy it. Or I heard that you know, Silence is awesome or something. 
there, there's going to be some exceptions to this that I'll talk about when you buy things, but right now I want to talk about how you assess your resources and what you have. So to start, you need to understand your financial resources. You, I, another spoiler alert, chances are you're going to ask for the InfoSec budget. It's not going to exist. Then you're going to ask for the IT budget, and if it exists, there's going to be nothing for security because chances are when you ask for what security spending has been done, management is going to say, well, we think that uh, antivirus and firewall is security. So we just want you to nail those two things down because that's all you need for security. I've seen that over and over again, so chances are that's what you're going to see when you ask for your budget. So that probably means you're not spending any extra money this year. What do we do with that? Well, that's, that's a huge part of this talk. That's also why I pre have a strong preference for open source. Um, again, get into that in a second. IT infrastructure, you may want to implement ELK. You may want to implement something that requires terabytes of data. You may not have that. Understand what sort of resources that you can dedicate to the tools that you want. Um, technical resources, if it's just you in InfoSec, if there's maybe a sysadmin, figure out who you can, uh, who, who you can borrow, what, what people are interested in hacking, what people are interested in these things that you can talk to their managers, figure out maybe I can use these people a little bit here and there. Um, this all goes into uh, organizational OSINT, figuring out uh, what resources, what, what all is there, and then which should probably go at the beginning is meet and greet. You need to, to meet department heads. You need to start figuring out what their pain points are and what it is. Well, and honestly, the disturbance that you can give to their resources because ultimately most people are going to view security in any of the controls that you implement as hindering what it is that they're doing. So start making friends at the beginning before ultimately you start breaking the systems that they've, the very, in secure systems that they've used for 10, 15 years, start to uh, make friends before they're your enemy. Sorry about that. Um, and I, I put OSINT in here, open source information, uh, open source intelligence. Um, that could really be added into every slide. Everything in here, you, you're going to need to go out and ask people because chances are the documentation sucks. Um, if I sound like a pessimist or a nihilist, uh, I've uh, and you're not, uh, we might work in different industries, I don't know. Uh, the, this is another boring part. This falls into the meet and greets, but understand your business objectives. Um, if, you're, if you're a numbers guy, if you enjoy doing risk assessment, um, that's very important. You may have a legal officer who can help you with this, but it comes down to figuring out if this, if this system is down for this long, how much money do we lose? Do we have those numbers? Maybe availability isn't important at all because maybe, you know, we don't have those, those firm of deadlines. I worked with a company that they said everything could be down for three days and all we would lose is some payroll. Um, that's, you're, you're probably never going to find that. That was, that was weird. But, um, and that, yeah, no, it, it is. Um, and it was a manufacturing company, but I don't know. The way that they worked, they said everything can be down for three days and we're, we wouldn't lose a penny. You're, you're never going to see that. Now, the thing is, because you don't have a large team, because you, you can't dedicate months to these things, and these are month-long tasks or three-month or year-long tasks, chances are you're going to have to stop these short of what is what you'd probably want to. But it really comes down to, and I'm going to reiterate this, is understanding what you have to secure and what you're securing against and what's the risk if you don't secure it. Um, business impact assessment is exactly what I was talking about um, with the risk assessment, just a little bit of a different spin on it. And then evaluate disaster recovery capabilities. If you ask IT, they're going to say, oh, we back up every hour, we back up every day, we back up whatever we can recover at this time. They, they have not done a DR simulation. Do that, force them to do that, whatever. Um, Chances are you will find that the only th that, that their, their backups are failing every few days because they don't have enough space, so your, your recovery point objective is down, your RTOs are down because chances are they've never recovered it, so they realize that it actually takes a week to restore because they're using backup exec from tape, something of that sort. And then I've had where the, the boot sector is corrupted on every, with Aperture, don't ever use it. Um, uh, Dell ruins everything they buy. We, we can talk about that later if you disagree. I'll win that argument. Um, 
the, then your, the last one that no one really talks about with disaster recovery is work recovery time. Just because you got the system up because, you know, it ran and it, it, maybe it ran in five minutes if you're using a good DR system. But if it didn't, then you just spent, a, you just spent 15 minutes every PC for 100, I mean, for every server for 100 servers, 20 servers, whatever it is, fixing the boot sector, um, you know, doing something of that sort. You have to figure that out and do this again and again and again until you actually know what it would take. Um, a big part of, data, uh, of business objectives is your data classification. Like I said, understand what you're securing. Um, if you're a manufacturer, maybe it's part numbers. You figure out that a part number is, you, you know, has a certain pattern, you search for that pattern. Um, maybe it's anything that has ITAR on it if you, if you do shipping and exporting to for, um, of military things. Uh, you can look for credit card strings, but data classification, figure out where your data is. Chances are no one, has, no one knows. Department by department, I have been surprised certain times you talk to a manager and they can tell you this is exactly where it is and then start securing it. Um, then metadata tags or changing in the, you know, putting watermarks, things like that are good for keeping your data classified. But I'm gonna get into the, the policies of that in a, in a moment. Um, also very important in the DR simulation is documenting it because maybe the entire team that you use to do your DR simulation, um, half of them are gone or they've forgotten because they've done a hundred other tasks since then. So document what worked, what didn't, what weird tricks you had to do. Um, it really comes in handy. Uh, recovery time objective, recovery point objective, and work recovery time. I tried to expand on most things. That slide would have been a little too long if I did that, and they were somewhat minor points. Go ahead. How far back you need to get up? Yeah, um, so recovery point objective is, um, well, from the objective side, it is the point to which the business needs to recover. So let's say that they need, they want to recover every hour, but then from the actual disaster recovery and the backup side of it is how often we have a backup that we could recover to. Then recovery time objective is how quickly we need to have this recovery done. And, and, the, and then into that recovery time objective, the work recovery time, the time it takes to actually, the, the technician resource that it takes to get that system up after the system has actually done its restore. I probably explained that somewhat poorly because it is not the primary thing I do, but. Cool. Um, this is a bit untraditional at this point. Um, evaluate user education. I'm gonna do it even before I get into threat modeling and the reason is, another spoiler alert, you are gonna find out that your users are your biggest threat. You're gonna find out that that is your biggest gap um, no matter what you do, your, your users are going to find a way to get around it. So, phishing simulation, um, sand securing the human, free tools, great. They also have some paid stuff, but um, FishMe has a, has a free tier. They have a paid tier, very good. No before is pretty much the industry leader that I, from, from what I see. Um, say what you will about Kevin Mitnick, that is not the, the topic here, but no before is a, is, is a good tool. Um, a caveat with no before, and this is an, un, an unsubstantiated story that I, that I overheard at B-Sides Vegas this year, but I'm going to repeat it because it, it reigns true, or it appears to be true. Um, if you've worked with no before, any of these phishing simulations, you know that there are templates that you can use. So, I heard a story of an organization that checked every single checkbox, send all emails, and, you know, randomized it. So, the CFO gets an email saying, you have been accused of sexual assault. Click on this link to see the, to see. He does not click the link, he runs screaming into the HR department. What the hell, I did not do this, whoever said it, you need to tell me right now, the HR department knows nothing about it, so it's a screaming match for a while. Now the company is no longer allowed to use any phishing simulation because they think that that's what phishing simulation is. No, that is being an idiot. That is, not, that is not testing your tools. Test every single tool before you implement it. Don't just, you wouldn't install an IDS on every single, or an IPS on every single box and then start blocking all of your traffic. No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't you know, blindly enable every single firewall rule. Test, test everything like you would test anything, okay? Um, surveys and quizzes, um, Stay Safe Online has 
some really good ones. These are a good way to figure out your user's other knowledge. Um, and then what I would do from this point, once you've gathered this information, do targeted user training. A formal user awareness training could take months to evaluate. But if you find out in an organization of 100 people that you have five people that you know, click on every single thing you send them and never forward to IT, sit them down for a day and explain things, then test them again and again and figure out, you know, those are your biggest risks, so focus on them. And like I said, this is really untraditional. People, this is usually step 100, because no one wants to talk to users. No one wants to do this stuff. If you don't want to actually do the training, for, force someone else to monitor the training and force them to go through some classes if you're, if you're not a public speaker, but I think this is your number one benefit. Um, we had an organization that has been fish that we work with that has been fished uh, three times in the last year. One time they were minutes away from sending sixty thousand dollars to the wrong company. Okay, um, so they they bring in they they bring in a, a manager of Im infosec to to replace us. Long story there, but. I tell him that the number one thing you need to do is user awareness training. He says, yeah, that, that's in my plan. Uh, we're about six months away from that, and it's going to be this long thing. And I'm like, no, no, no. Right now, you need to do fishing simulation. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. You don't understand. You are going to, con they, they have compliance needs, and they have, they have had customer information breached on two of the occasions. That, 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 that's completely intolerable, but they're, they, because however he wants to do things, He's not willing to put the user training at that moment. I'm going to tell another very interesting story about that same person in a bit. But, uh, um, and, and then you'll, you'll see, I said planning and discovery here, but then I've already implemented a remediation into this phase. I, I've, I've done that intentionally. I think that if all you did for your first six months or even six weeks, even six days was documentation, um, you're losing opportunities. So I think mixing some of these things up and figuring out what's most important and doing it earlier than I prescribe is, is great. Um, this may be a point if you, if the targeted, if, if you don't think targeted user training is enough that you may really think about MFA because that is a, while it is not a silver bullet, it will help a lot of things here. Um, this may be a point where you consider MFA. I generally like to put MFA much later because it is one of the most time intensive things to implement correctly. Um, and I, again, I can get into that later. Um, back to understanding what it is that you need to secure. You need to understand what hardware and software you have. Um, there are a lot of tools for this. Um, any help desk system that you have, if you have SolarWinds help desk, it, it does automatic scans. Um, if you don't have anything automated for this, um, using Nmap, um, the Nmap cookbook is a great resource. You can get a lot of this information. A VAS system, I'll talk about that a little later, um, can, will give you a lot of this. It is not meant as an asset discovery tool, but it can be a poor man's asset discovery tool. Um, also, Active Directory. Is, is great because you will figure out a lot of what's in there. You will probably cringe at certain things that shouldn't be in there, but it is not enough unless you cross-check it because there, there may be, you, you may discover that you have 50% of your, your endpoints aren't even in Active Directory. Um, I am working on a PowerShell tool that will eventually be on GitHub that does a, an IP scan of your entire range and then checks if anything's in Active Directory because that is a huge pain point for me. Um, so follow me on Twitter if you want to see that eventually. Um, and then my, and Microsoft Baseline Configuration Analyzer, a lot of the same things. Uh, a little more information and a little more uh, resources. I would say none of, none of these, except for Active Directory PowerShell scans, should you run just blindly in the middle of the day. Cer certain VAS scans, you know, if you use Open VAS, you do full and fast ultimate. Uh, that, that can brick your system, don't, don't DDoS yourself. Um, and then this is, a, you know, a good play, it, something that I didn't include because I, again, I'm a pessimist. I didn't include OSINT in this piece. I did not say go ask IT, um, cause in my experience, one or two of the many organizations I've worked with actually have proper asset lists. Um, so you, you could, you, you should still ask, but chances are you, it, it won't be fruitful. So, threat modeling. 
Um, this could be an entire talk, and ultimately this is what drove me to give this talk, is know what you're protecting and what you're protecting against. The same story I was just telling about fishing. The, the gentleman, when he came in, and I use gentleman loosely, he was obsessed with encryption. And yes, encryption is great, but he was not talking about disk system encryption. He was not talking about in transit encryption. He was talking about encrypting hard drives. Now, certain threat models that might be very important to encrypt hard drives. The problem is, you could not social engineer yourself into this building. You cannot get, it is almost impossible to get in this building. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried other people. It, you cannot social engineer your way in. There's only one entryway. They do not allow tailgating. So, physical security isn't as much of a risk. They also don't have any laptops. So, no one can get into the building to steal a hard drive, which is technically the use case you're protecting against, but He's really worried about this, but what he's not worried about is the fact that they do not close or lock the server room door ever. To me, the number one thing that you would do to protect against steal someone stealing your server hard drive is lock the damn door or close it. But the reason that they don't lock the door is because two reasons. One, the thermostat is on the wrong side of the wall. The thermostat is, on, is, is where the, the, the sysadmin sits. So he leaves that door open. Now, he's also, he's the, he used to be the facilities manager, so he would be the one that would be able to move this, but okay, fine, so just lock the door into his office. No, he leaves it open so that the, so that the cleaning crew can come in and take out the crash at night. So, very easy mitigation here. Now, what I wish I had said to him was, why are you so concerned about physical security? That wasn't in my threat model. I, I could have been sarcastic. I dropped it because he wasn't having anything, and I'm not going to waste my time on a fruitless conversation. But he, he was protecting against something because maybe that's the first thing he implemented, or maybe he thinks it's so easy. Um, it's not necessarily. Hard drive encryption, while it can be easy, you can just deploy BitLocker by GP. Um, if there's any key mismanagement, all of a sudden you lose a bunch of hard drives, and your sysadmin now has to resolve issues with 25% of your PCs because they can't get to any data because they don't have the encryption key. Um, again, smaller use case, but it is possible. So, um, know what you're protecting, know what you're protecting against. Intel sources for this, um, you, could use, you, you could use common common sense, potentially. You could say maybe I'm a private company, so I might have certain attacks, this or that, but there, this is a good point to start asking questions. Look at the, the U, US CERT will give you um, a, there is a website um, on US, a site, a database on US CERT where you can look up uh, previous um, data breaches. And you can say, you know, in this industry, this size, blah, blah, blah. You, you can set parameters. So find similar companies how they've been breached. Protect against that. Go to CISO roundtables. Find people in your industry because chances are, if you're the only IT person you need, or the only you know infosec person, you aren't getting good information. So go get as much information as you can. Um, find out, ask other people what what it is you know that that they've found, what you need to protect against, and then look in your own network, see what attacks they've there have been. If they have kept incident reports, look at that. See maybe they've been fished six times in the last year. Protect against that first. So, um, and then I place this after information gathering steps because you need to understand what it is you have before you can even know what it is you're protecting. So, um, and then gap analysis, use the framework that you have. Um, does not need to be with an auditor at this point unless you're using ISO, but do, do a gap analysis, look at, all your uh, look at all the compliance needs, figure out where you are, and use this as a, and use all the information up to this point for a, pla a project plan or POANM. I hate the acronym, I don't know why you put an AND in there, but it's a government acronym, so they do weird things. Um, a, a POAM is Plan of Action and Milestones. Um, so project plan is a good thing to do at this point so you know what order you're doing things in. Also, Quick point, pen test is not a gap analysis. Everyone, people very often hear pen test, red team, they want to do this at this point. Um, 
your gap analysis will tell you as much or more than a red team will. You're not ready for a red team. They can get in. Anyone can get in. Um, they, you know, they could look you up on, on LinkedIn and get in just with the information off of LinkedIn, chances are. So do not waste your time or money on a pen test at this point. If anything, if you're going to waste the time, bring in a, a, pro a proper auditor to come in and, and tell you your gaps. But just don't waste the money. This is, this is a, a self-help um, thing. Uh, this is me preaching to myself, rest. Uh, someone said this to me recently. I don't know where it came from, but I like it. Exhaustion is what our culture views as courage. No. Being exhausted is not bravery. It is, it is not what we need to do. Now, chance, there will be times that you're going to be exhausted because you have a, huge tasks against you, uh, uh, ahead of you. But one tip, let's say that you have a framework. You want to be... 25, 30% against that framework. Reduce whatever that is by 25%. If you want to remediate 60 controls, go down to 40 controls. Set your goals a little lower. So if you pass them, everyone looks good, but you also don't have to, at the last minute, work on remediating a bunch of things and writing a bunch of documents. Try not to take work home. It's not always possible, um, but, but try. And then take your vacation time, if, if you have it. Um, also, try and negotiate for vacation, for mm, a reasonable amount of vacation time. Um, now, at the end of this phase, talk with management. I recommend that every three to four months, every quarter, let's say, you meet with management. Now, you won't always be able to, but getting your cause, getting security in front of them is very important. They need to know what it is that you're doing, what it is that you're securing, what threats are out there. Give them news in this. Now, avoid FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I, I am not a fan of it. Uh, don't just say, oh, Russia's going to attack you. Chances are, uh, it, if there's, you know, chances are they're not directly targeted. Russia has enough targets if, you, if you're not working for, for a big firm. In my experience, not as big of a target. Present the findings you have to this point. Um, you know, all the documentation that you have is ready. Do that. Discuss potential costs. At this point, you might know what sort of resource issues you have. Maybe talk about bringing in an MSSP. I know that is somewhat of a bad word. Um, I work for what might be classified as an MSSP. I don't think it has to be a bad word. But and for who doesn't know, whoever doesn't know that acronym, that's Managed um, Security Solutions Provider, essentially an IT provider that focuses on security. So um, this would be a point to say, hey, you know, th I have this, this, and that that I think I need to buy. This, use this to increase buy-in, and then again, talk about what, I've, what I mentioned earlier with um, ISO as a potential security, uh, as a sales tactic. Um, so now, I know this sounds very similar to the information gathering, but it's analysis and documentation. This is where you put your plan a step farther. You start gaining level two information. You don't just have, this is what I think. You really dive into the network and start figuring things out. So no, you don't start buying things now either. You can. If you don't want to use open source, that is fine. You don't have to. I, I know that resource, you know, you may not have the resources to work on open source, but Open VAS is Open VAS is not as difficult as you'd think to implement. In my experience, it can take about 20 minutes um, if you have a good system. It doesn't take a lot of resources. Um, if you have the ability to implement Elk, Elk, um, that's the Elastic Stack for as a SIM, or maybe even not as a SIM yet. Um, Voln Whisperer is great for Open VAS. It will. You don't have to use it with OpenVS. It actually has Nessus and uh, Qualys um, plugins as well, but it's a great way to visualize. Um, and then I, I, I put this before patching because that's going to be one of the number one ways that you reduce your vulnerabilities. So by, by doing this before patching, you can show a pretty chart and say, we have reduced our vulnerabilities by 30% or hopefully much more. Show that to your um, show that to management, and it'll be a shiny report. Um, generate differential reports, exactly what I was just saying, and then show it and look up for external ports. Hopefully, you're able to see your external ports from your firewall rules. Maybe you'll find something else on Shodan. Um, patching just talked about this. Um, I, this should probably go without saying, but don't don't automatically deploy 
patches to, to your servers, that's probably not a great idea. Maybe you have them set to install you know, on Fridays, something of that sort, and then you check them the next day, but I really, I, I do them manually. Um, but you can do them automated for endpoints. Um, that's a little less of a pain point in my experience. You can also, if you're using WSS, you can release patches, patches slowly to certain groups so that you reduce, especially if you're just now in implementing WSS and you have 260 patches per machine, that, that does happen, um, then maybe release them slowly. Um, try and gather a team of people who can help with server patching. Um, WSUS, while it is the easy choice, uh, it can be really high maintenance. There are great resources to, to, to get WSUS working, but um, maybe you use another tool. Com if you don't want to work with an MSSP, Komodo actually has a tool. Um, you, you have to sign up as an MSSP, but it's free, and they, you can, if you deploy it to all your PCs, all your servers, you can patch from there. I know Komodo doesn't have the best rep, but trust me, it's good. Um, like I said, every MSP and MSSP will have patching software. That could be a security risk as well, because then that comes with an RMM most of the time, and then suddenly maybe 100 people who work for them have a backdoor into your system. You need to figure that out. But, and reiterating what I said in the last slide, this is placed right after vulnerability assessments, so you can document your results. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I talked about it a bit, but um, widespread user education. This is when you start not just doing your targeted, this would be a great time to actually deploy widespread user education. So stay safe online, I've already talked about SAN securing the human, has a lot of free resources, they can also send teams. Um, now this also security policies are, are huge. Acceptable use is your number one to, to knock out. Um, that's what every user has to sign. Um, except, excess, acceptable use of um, you know, IT resources. But um, there's probably 30, 40 policies you'll need by the end of it. SANS has some great ones. But there, in my experience, there's a little more customization that you need to do. Charles Cresson has ones, I think they're about 1,500 bucks. Um, those are really good. Um, and though that's on um, Security Shield. Um, if you aren't comfortable customizing security policies, um, you're not a writer, work with legal HR. Have someone else kind of outsource this if you can. Now, um, I mean, at this point, hopefully you haven't had to do any incident response. You may have if you work with any orgs that I've worked with. Um, but use this time to start figuring out your policies and procedures. Maybe, maybe do a tabletop exercise. Start figuring out with your threat model what you think you might need to protect against. Um, important is to work with legal, HR, PR, everyone to figure out when do we report to, when do we report to law enforcement. I know that nobody wants to do it, but sometimes with compliance needs, you have to. A side note there is that you have ransomware, there is a very, very good chance that the FBI already has the decryption key. I know you don't want to call them, but they don't actually have to mandate to report this, and the FBI will help you decrypt. Yeah, I know it's not a fun call to make, but it is, it is something to have there. Um, and like, I said, like I've said many times, compliance requirements will kind of force your hand in breach reporting but maybe have some canned letters, things like that. Establish a, a CERT team, computer emergency response team. Re, the T is redundant, but you know. Um, try and involve people from legal, HR, maybe even different departments, you know, PR, uh, marketing, management, obviously InfoSec, and then um, IT. This is a bit early to do this, like I said, but nothing will tar tarnish the image of your department like poor incident response. Change management, I'm gonna go through this fairly quick because I mean, ultimately it's logging what you do and chances are there's two of you. There's IT and then you. Um, it's not necessarily your job. IT or management should have already mandated this, but it will be if change management doesn't happen, if ch weird changes start happening. Even track changes that you don't think require approvals, restarting a backup server in the middle of the day, track it. Easiest way is Excel. It's harder to do approvals that way, but you know, don't over-engineer. Internet or SharePoint is great. Don't just create a SharePoint for it because then you're a SharePoint admin. But if someone's doing SharePoint, log on, you know, tack onto that. If you're already using G Suite, use Google Form, that's easy. And then if you have a help desk system, chances are you could just uh, create
create a, cha a change control a change control tab in there as one of your incident types. Now that we're, we're ending this phase, talk with management. At this point, you've already partially implemented a number of controls without doing much. Not all the sub-controls, but that is a win. Show them what you've checked off. Incorporate some training. Talk to them about a few more high-level things that you have so far. Get some feedback on the user pane because management's going to know they're going to have heard, heard complaints and you don't want, you know, you, you want to hedge that before you can. Review the security policies if you've written them yet and then get, get approval on them so you can start implementing the security policies you've written. Now, we're going to jump into what I think everyone wants to be the fun part, mitigation and remediation. You start actually doing the, the real implementation. Do I start buying things now? Maybe. This actually may be the time that you do it, but chances are, like I've said, you don't have budget. So, um, first mitigation, least privilege. If you have Active Directory, um, that means Active Directory delegation. With file servers, um, same thing, Rev, you know, Use PowerShell to, to get all of your ACLs. Um, so the discovery, use, like I said, use PowerShell. Figure out who has what resources, who's a domain admin, who's enterprise admin, schema admins, things that you may not check. Um, talk to people. Figure out if they're supposed to be there. Um, who, yeah, who, who can approve you removing them? Maybe you can just do it. And then Bloodhound um, is a tool you can find on GitHub that is really good for enumerating um, complex AD um, relationships. And AD is Active Directory. Um, I'd assume anyone who's in here knows Active Directory, but if not, props for sitting around so long. Um, Procmon, Process Monitor, manage, Process Monitor is great for removing local admin. Um, you, you can use, there, there are plenty of articles out there on how to do this, but you can see what it is when you have gotten rid of local administrator privileges, what it is that breaks on whatever application. They're using SAP, they're using uh, SolidWorks, whatever breaks, you can you see it in process ma monitor, what it is that it's trying to access and then give the proper permissions. Um, and then, you know, reproduce that on multiple PCs or automate it by group policy. Um, and I've already kind of talked about the reduction of privileged AD accounts. Um, that's good. I am, again, a, a little to my empty GitHub, a little bit of a shout out. I am working on uh, finalizing some scripts that I use for creating a, essentially a golded image for a delegated organizational unit structure with the proper permissions. Um, it's just not pretty enough to, to show yet. So easy wins. Each of these could have their own slide, but that's really not my focus here. So firewall rule closures, you could fairly easily determine that uh, port 53 from your exchange server does not need to be open to the internet. Never does, guarantee it. Certain things you may be able to close. You can test these on the weekend, okay? And, um, but I mean, th while I say easy win, that doesn't, I don't mean any disrespect. It may not be easy, but the, these, these are things that can really help you secure with a small, potentially small impact. Um, session lockout, you know, so that your PCs don't just stay open for forever. Actually, you know, 5, 10, 15, 30 minutes, have your PCs actually lock. A pre-log on advisory doesn't really make anything more secure, makes management a little happy because it's visible. By logging into the system, you agree to company A's security policies and you've signed the acceptable use um, policy that legal will be happy with you. Let's do it. Um, this is, as I talked about encryption, it might be hard for you to push encryption to all PCs, but add it into your PC build list. Maybe, you know, add a few other security things, but that's a big one. Just enable BitLocker when you build every new PC. It's already there. Cool. Um, account auditing, I talked about this a little in the last slide, but chances are, from what I've seen, you have a bunch of p computers that, or a bunch of users that haven't changed their password in three, four years. Um, force password changes, maybe incrementally so that everyone doesn't come in and they can't get in their email tomorrow, but um, you can do it by, base, by last logon. Um, Active Directory, you can just filter by last logon date greater than uh, 90 days and then work with HR to figure out if those users should actually have access. 
replacement and renewals. This is the first slide where I talk about potentially buying something. Chances are you have licenses that you need to pay for. So this is a good chance if, to increase security with easy wins. If you are already paying, if you already have to pay it, it's not, all, it's not necessarily that much more for next-gen antivirus, NJAV. Um, but, but you know, something like Silence can greatly increase your security posture. It can protect you against zero days. Not, again, nothing that I'm saying is a silver bullet, but it does a lot more than typical AV without much more money. Um, someone from Silence called it poor man's app whitelisting. You can just, you can, you can block TeamViewer with a click of a button. You can also restrict any changes from being made to any applications on the PC with a click of a button. Um, so app locker is not that difficult, but this is actually easier. You can do removable media, uh, removable media control pretty easily. You can restrict by, um, you can restrict any new ones, you can, you can whitelist um, you know, only certain serial numbers or vendors or something of that sort. Um, but next gen antivirus, silence, I said I wouldn't talk too much about um, you know, commercial tools, but silence could be a huge win. Um, network refresh, there is a very good chance that you have a network with all layer two switches. Um, and maybe even you have an old Cisco ASA that uh, is throttling you at 10 meg and you're paying for 300 meg and everyone's wondering why it's slow. <laughs> um, if that's painful, then you've, you've, you've experienced this. Um, network refresh, you know, maybe you have the money, you're still paying licensing, maybe it's not that much more expensive to replace with Fortinet, Palo Alto. I would recommend Fortinet, you can fight me later. Um, and then access points with radius. Um, I, every place that I've gone, I have tried to put in wireless last but wireless always ends up being one of the first things because I see a bunch of commercial home uh, access points, can't even call them access points, a bunch of little dumb net gears that are terrible, drop connections all the time. And uh, wireless ends up being a huge pain point from a usability perspective, so then we come in and replace them and replace them with something that will do radius um, so that you can authenticate against Active Directory. And please don't be using WEP even though that is pretty widespread. Here's some maybes. Um, there's a very good chance you're going to do none of this, but consider it. Um, change service accounts and admin passwords. This should be one of the number one things you do because, you know, you may have all lowercase no numbers for all of your service accounts and for all, for all your firewalls, but it could be very time consuming. It could break a lot. You may not have enough information. It is the number one thing you could do, but I understand if you move it to later. Principle of least functionality and hardening, um, block ports that, that aren't needed, uninstall apps that aren't needed. Hard to do, good. Sim, um, Elk, Splunk, Splunk's expensive, Elk is great, but probably hard to do. Um, IDS, IPS, network-based uh, or host-based, um, you can do it with bro, something of that sort, um, but also maybe not immediately. And then LAPS, a uh, local admin password solution so that you're not manually managing passwords on every endpoint. Um, it's pretty easy to implement for Windows. Um, you'll notice I don't have DLP, FIM, web application, uh, firewall, or web filter. Those aren't in my threat model. You could put them in, and these aren't in any order of priority. Um, your third and probably least eventful um, talk with management, but reiterate that just because no money has been spent or little money has been spent, that's not the expectation going forward. There will be costs associated with InfoSec. Let them know that because at this point they've gotten used to three quarters of you not spending any money. That's not, that, that's not gonna be the case going forward or at least you hope so. Um, and then get their input on the potential budget because you're reaching the end of the year, it's budget season. So. Um, figure out how much money, what their priorities may be, and then talk to them and even think yourself if you want to use an MSSP for a SOC because there are some huge benefits with that. There are also some negatives, but outside of the scope here. So I'm going to, uh, looking forward, this is going to be kind of prioritizing your budget. Um, so maybe redistribute your survey from the beginning where you start seeing your user, um, if your user awareness has improved. Start, ask them questions like their perceived 
the, the perceived improvements that they've gotten. Maybe they've gotten less spam because you've tweaked spam filter rules. Um, measure their user pain. Maybe they're really pissed off because now they can't access a file the way they used to or they really loved RDP from home and now they have to use VPN. Figure out what and figure out how you can kind of, you know, massage their back a little bit. Um, allow suggestions. Give them a suggestion field. You probably don't want to read it because it might not be great, but yeah. Um, and then use your own self-assessment. You know, think about what you can do. Um, look at your differential reports. There's been a lot of reports I've talked about so far. Perform another gap analysis, vulnerability scan, redistribute the survey. Um, okay. And then now that you've gathered information, prepare your budget. Set your priorities based on the findings in that last slide. Reevaluate your threat model. Do you think that next year, do you think that the threat model that you established at the beginning is still true? Have you seen things that you didn't know about at the beginning? Do you have um, certain risks that you weren't aware of? You found some, you know, some data somewhere that's really important and no one told you about it? You might have to kind of change your priorities. Um, for the ne suggestions, next year, like I said, MFA is very important. Um, I think a SIM could be very important. Um, Think about it. Network overhaul, like I talked about before, and all the suggestions from renewals and replacements, those are good wins. Those are great things to put in there. So um, now you're going to talk with management. This is fairly straightforward because you're going to present the budget. Um, you're going to reiterate InfoSec as a potential profit center. I know anyone in accounting will kill me for this, but InfoSec can be a profit center. If you prove that it's not just costing money, that it is saving money and maybe even bringing in money by people realizing that you care about their security, it can become a profit center. It takes a ton of work, but it can. Um, and ultimately management will love you. Accounting will argue that it can never be a profit center, but it can at least in, it can at least in semantics be a, a profit center. Um, present your compliance improvement goals for the next year. Again, I would, um, I would probably bring them down by 25% because you want to under under commit and over um, over do. My, my brain shut off for a second. Thank you. Uh, over deliver. Thank you. Under commit and over deliver. Um, present your differential reports and then maybe at this point use a little bit more of some advanced training. Talk to them about what MFA is, what some of the things you're doing. Maybe your management doesn't care. Maybe they do. I've seen a good mix. So in conclusion, the TLDR, um, too long didn't read. I actually was very surprised recently to find out that a surprising amount of people did not know what TLDR was. Um, I spend more time on Reddit than those people. So um, this is essentially, if you've been asleep the last 40 minutes, this is what I've talked about. Set your priorities based on your business objectives. Threat model everything, threat model all the things. Discover everything, know what you're securing. Educate the users, back up everything, because ransomware. And then I would say open source all the things. You may not, so don't necessarily open source all the things. Um, like I have said, oh, and then buy all the things eventually. Don't do it this year. Don't spend a bunch of money and then just have a bunch of systems sitting around. Um, yeah, no, I could tell too many stories on that. So um, if I actually have it on my Twitter handle, so if you if you follow me or just check me out on Twitter, you can see the link to my website with the talks. Um, if you have questions, um, I'm not going to have time for questions right now, but if you find me after or tweet them to me, I will answer. Um, but yeah, thanks for being a great auntie and thanks for listening. <laughs> hmm? uh, I'm good. <laughs>